This is the Emergency Medical Minute, sponsored by Health One. Hey guys, it's Rachel Duncan, clinical pharmacist here for your second Pharmacy Friday Emergency Medical Minute. We are going to do part two today of our infectious disease topic about antibiotics. Specifically last week, we talked about the fluoroquinolones and some of the reasons why we don't use fluoroquinolones as much as we may have over the past few decades. And so by overusing the fluoroquinolones, we have just kind of discovered three different concerns. And those are one, patient adverse reactions. And we talked about some of those. Two, these patient adverse reactions have actually led to increased risk of safety concerns. Even going so far as to coin a new term, which is fluoroquinolone associated disability. So, fluoroquinolones account for so many more disability reports when compared to other classes. And so, that's pretty concerning and definitely a reason why we may want to avoid these. And then, third concern here is that overuse of fluoroquinolones has really led to the development of drug resistance. And so we talked about what poor susceptibilities many institutions have towards agents like bufloxacin and ciprofloxacin at this point, and uh, maybe why we wouldn't use it for some of those common infections that we see come into the ER. And so three infection types that we talked about are pneumonia, specifically immunity-acquired pneumonia, and then when we might advance up to something if you were concerned with a multi-drug resistant organism, if you had a concern for MRSA or pseudomonas, or if a patient truly had a hospital or ventilator-acquired pneumonia, sort of what our options would be instead of agents like levofloxacin. We also talked about urinary tract infection or UTI, and again, looking at whether it is complicated or uncomplicated, and whether you're worried about multi-drug resistance, and um, antibiotics that we would use um, instead of reaching for ciprofloxacin. And then the last type of infection that we talked about commonly seen in the emergency room are intra-abdominal infections. And again, how can we avoid using levofloxacin and ciprofloxacin in those types of situations? And I think what we found ourselves using quite often is a couple different drug classes, but specifically the penicillins and then the cephalosporins really come to our rescue and our first line um, for most patients presenting with different types of infections. And so one of the barriers to using these two different classes of medications are allergies, um, specifically allergy to penicillins and related antibiotics. When you think of amoxicillin, things like that, This is actually the most commonly reported drug allergy in the United States. It's actually estimated that 10% of patients or over 30 million people self-report as being penicillin allergic. However, 9 out of 10 reporting penicillin allergy are not truly allergic when tested. And so that's a pretty startling statistic. And why do we care about this? Well, because it is first-line therapy for many of the infections that we talked about, either penicillin or cephalosporin. And so if you can't use those agents, then you have to use some of these alternative agents that may not be as ideal and may lead to more adverse reactions. So some interesting facts here. As I mentioned, 9 out of 10 reporting penicillin allergy are not truly allergic. 80% of patients with an IgE-mediated penicillin allergy actually lose their sensitivity after 10 years. So that's just interesting since a lot of folks carry that allergy from childhood experience. Carrying an inaccurate diagnosis of a penicillin, quote, allergy could adversely affect the quantity and quality of healthcare use. So it's been um, tied to increased length of stay for some patients. And like I mentioned, not receiving what would be our first line therapies, which could lead to increased healthcare utilization and costs. Patients labeled penicillin allergic have a threefold increased risk of adverse events. And so to go into this even further, patients claiming a penicillin allergy compared to control subjects have actually been found to have a 23% higher incidence of C. diff, a 14% higher incidence of MRSA, and a 30% higher incidence of VRE infections. And as you can imagine, if we are avoiding these safe, effective agents, 
and we're having to use more agents. For example, the fluoroquinolones, as we talked about, that maybe don't have as good a susceptibility or have a higher risk of adverse events, um, then it's going to lead to some of these concerns. And so um, fluoroquinolones are certainly not the only class that is less than ideal. I think probably not being able to use a penicillin or cephalosporin leads some folks to um, rely on clindamycin. And of course, we know that that can lead to a higher incidence of C. diff when compared to other antibiotics such as amoxicillin. And so I think that's when we really start to realize that penicillin allergy or being labeled as penicillin allergic really does have quite the impact on patient care. And so one thing to know here is that penicillin skin testing is a relatively new and novel way to reduce the use of broad spectrum antibiotics and can have a significant and immediate impact on antibiotic usage. And so it's actually highly recommended that this be a part of a comprehensive antibiotic stewardship program. In fact, 98% of hospitalized subjects with a history of penicillin allergy would actually have a negative result if tested. That is overwhelming to me and just really tells me that maybe we don't have to be as thoughtful with our antibiotic choices if we could just eliminate these false allergies and be able to use our first line agents. Penicillin skin testing frequently has allowed for less expensive agents that would have been avoided due to a reported allergy. And so just some food for thought to get you thinking about you know, when your patient comes in and, and says to you, I have a penicillin allergy, I think a few considerations to keep in mind. One, don't simply accept penicillin allergy as a reason that an alternate antibiotic, such as a fluoroquinolone, must be utilized. I would encourage you to investigate that allergy further. So look at the specific allergy and their reaction to determine if it's even a true allergy and then what the severity of the allergy is. So if that allergy reported is more of an adverse drug reaction compared to a true allergy, oftentimes it's completely reasonable to continue to utilize a penicillin or even a cephalosporin at the um, clinician's discretion. And so I think you all know what I'm talking about. There's a huge difference between an anaphylactic reaction as in, i.e., my throat closed and I had to go to the emergency room and go to the ICU versus I had some stomach upset or I had some diarrhea or even I had a rash. Those are all things that are we can manage and don't necessarily indicate a true allergy. So just some food for thought there. If the allergy is not severe, consider utilizing a cephalosporin determined based on non-similar side chains and the indication for the antibiotic. So I think one thing that a lot of folks don't realize, including myself before I was educated by my favorite ID pharmacist, cross-reactivity between cephalosporins and penicillins is actually most often dictated by the side chain of the antibiotic rather than the actual beta-lactam ring. So let's say you did have someone with a penicillin allergy that reported a fairly severe rash that makes you think, you know, I actually don't want to use a penicillin in them, and I'm getting this flag for that could also be cross-reactive with a cephalosporin, kind of dig into that further. And so I'm actually going to make sure we include here a chart for antibiotics with similar side chains that may need to be avoided, and it has on there several penicillin options several cephalosporin options, and sort of which cross-react with other agents. And so most recent studies really challenge the idea of broad cross-reactivity between penicillins and cephalosporins. A true penicillin anaphylaxis incidence is actually very, very low. So even when that is reported, certainly take it seriously, but just know that that incidence is actually lower than 1%, even lower than 0.1%. It actually comes in at 0.01 to 0.04%. And as I mentioned before, up to 90% of patients who report that penicillin allergy, typically a less severe allergy, are not truly allergic. Also, cross-reactivity, as I mentioned, between penicillins and cephalosporins is not a class effect. 
as well as with carbapenems. And we're not going to go too deep into carbapenem use today um, because, as we know, those tend to be broader spectrum antibiotics that aren't necessarily always needed first line. But just know that the cross reactivity between those three classes is, in fact, not a class effect. And I think it's frustrating sometimes in all of our EHRs when we're constantly getting these pop ups and flags that come to us saying, ooh, penicillin allergy, do you still want to use that? Let's talk a little bit about a couple of the specific cephalosporins that we might be interested in. Um, I think one that I commonly um, get questions on is if a patient tolerated cefazolin, so our first generation IV cephalosporin, cephalexin, the first generation oral cephalosporin option, are actually not the same structurally. Cephazolin has a completely different side chain. So if a patient has a true penicillin allergy, it will actually usually cross-react with cephalexin. And so that was actually a surprise to me. Oftentimes, I don't have any issue um, with sending maybe a penicillin allergic child home with a um, cephalexin um, prescription. I think I need to keep in mind that if it's a non-severe allergy, sure, Um, But if it is, it actually does have quite a bit of cross-reactivity due to a similar side chain, and therefore should be looking at maybe a second-generation cephalosporin if appropriate. Um, Also, oftentimes, if someone is penicillin allergic, I will look and see what cephalosporins they have had in the past and if they've tolerated those. Of course, if they've had any surgery at your institution, they probably received a dose of pre-op cephazolin right? We're going to be using that for pre-op um, antibiotic prophylaxis. And so if I see that they've received that and not had an issue with it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they can then go home um, on an oral um, cephalexin. But other oral cephalosporins would be okay. And so I would encourage you to take a look at that really useful chart that I'm including. And again, I just want to give a shout out this week Um, to Dr. Nicole Neville. She is a wonderful ID pharmacist that I work with and is the one that created this chart that has been so helpful to me. So one thing to note, if someone does have a penicillin allergy, as I mentioned, of course, that's going to cross-react with amoxicillin, ampicillin, and then the two cephalosporins that I really try to avoid are cephalexin, as I mentioned, due to that similar side chain, and then cefoxetin. Beyond that, the other cephalosporins, as I mentioned, IV cefazolin, cefuroxime, ceftriaxone, our go-to third-generation cephalosporin, and cefepime and ceftazidine really don't share that side chain and should be fine in a penicillin-allergic patient. And so I think that's really key um, for opening up the use of cephalosporins in our penicillin, truly penicillin-allergic patients. And so again, just go to this chart and sort of check it out. I think it will really open up your use of penicillins and cephalosporins. Because as we chatted about last week, and just going back to our three um, commonly seen infections in the emergency department, when we are looking at pneumonia, of course, for community-acquired pneumonia, ceftriaxone plus azithromycin is going to be your first-line therapy. And only if they have a severe beta-lactam allergy, including to cephalosporins, is the only time that you would actually go to something like a fluoroquinolone, so levofloxacin, for example. Um, But again, I would just really encourage you to dig deeper into that penicillin and even cephalosporin allergy. An allergy to one cephalosporin does not necessarily preclude you from using any cephalosporin. It is not a class effect. So just a very important thing to note there. Thanks for tuning in to this week's Pharmacy Friday Emergency Medical Minute. This has been Dr. Rachel Duncan, Emergency Medicine Clinical Pharmacist, here chatting today about penicillin and cephalosporin allergies and just hoping that the information provided and the resources posted can really help you be more thoughtful about your antibiotic choices and just more appropriate with your use of antibiotics. So hope you guys have a good week. I'll see you next week. We are on a quest to provide the world with free medical education. Please help us out by rating us on iTunes, following us on social media, and subscribing to our newsletter at emergencymedicalminute.com.